This lecture provides a brief introduction to imaging of Waldeyer's ring, the lymphatic tissue that surrounds the oropharynx and nasopharynx. We divide Waldeyer's ring into three areas, the adenoids, the palatine tonsils, and the lingual tonsils. Together, these areas form a circle or ring that surrounds the nasopharynx and oropharynx. The adenoids are in the midline of the nasopharynx, the palatine tonsils are on either side of the oropharynx, and the lingual tonsil completes the ring as it comes across the base of tongue, again in the oropharynx. We'll start with the tonsils. The palatine tonsils can be affected by benign findings, by infection, most commonly, and sometimes, unfortunately, by neoplasms. The benign findings include coarse calcifications that are a result of chronic inflammation. Uh, mucus retention cysts can occur on any mucosal surface and can certainly occur along the tonsils themselves. What makes these somewhat confusing, though, is the anatomy of the tonsils. Remember that the tonsils are not a solid mass, but instead have deep crypts where mucosa folds down in and then returns to the surface of the tonsil. This anatomy colors a lot of what we see in the tonsils, including mucus retention cysts, which can look like they are actually inside the tonsil, but instead are just in one of these deep crypts and are still along the mucosal surface. The tonsils can be affected by a variety of infections. Certainly bacterial infections are what we image most frequently, but Epstein-Barr virus mononucleosis will cause the tonsils to enlarge, as will HIV, and that is a very important differential consideration in patients who have enlargement of Waldeyer's ring. The two neoplasms that most commonly affect the tonsils are squamous cell carcinoma and lymphoma. Squamous cell carcinoma arising within Waldeyer's ring is often associated with the human papillomavirus and thus has cystic metastases. Lymphoma tends to have solid metastases. This is an example of the coarse calcifications that are a benign finding that are the result of chronic inflammation within the tonsils and are, can be written off as tonsilliths there are no adverse clinical consequences to these, although they are occasionally palpable or can be felt with the patient's tongue and be a little annoying. Here's an example of a mucus retention cyst that happened to arise in the adenoids. In fact, it arose deep within the fossa of Rosenmuller and as it expanded, extended out into the nasopharynx. When we see cystic masses along these mucosal surfaces, it's easy to attribute these to mucus retention cysts. Just make sure that there's no enhancing nodular component. Mucosal retention cysts can occur on any mucosal surface. This is an example of a mucosal retention cyst arising from the base of tongue, from the lingual tonsil, and filling the vallecula. Mucosal retention cysts that occur in this location are referred to as molecular cysts. Moving on to infections. When we have an acute bacterial infection of the tonsils, it results in an acute tonsillitis, and this has a characteristic radiologic appearance. This tiger stripe or serpentine or zebra, stri tri zebra stripe pattern is characteristic of acute tonsillitis. What we're seeing here is enhancement of the mucosa, but the mucosa goes down into the crypts and back out to the surface again. So this is a mucosal enhancement pattern. Interspersed between the enhancing areas are edematous areas of parenchyma within the gland, and that's what causes this tiger stripe appearance in the setting of acute tonsillitis. Usually these patients are never imaged because the diagnosis is clinically obvious. The uh, presence of reactive adenopathy is unsurprising in this case. Sometimes, if the initial infection is not completely cured, patients will return a week, two weeks later, with some similar symptoms, but they're no longer having an acute tonsillitis. Now they're having a complication, and this is complication, this is the most common complication, is a peritonsillar abscess. Now, tonsillar abscesses themselves are uncommon because if you try to form an abscess within the parenchyma, 
you will be near one of the mucosal surfaces because of the crypts, and you will erupt into a crypt and autolyze the abscess. But if you can get your infection deep to the uh, capsule of the tonsil, there you can form an abscess between the tonsil capsule and the superior pharyngeal constrictor muscle, and that is where we get peritonsillar abscesses. The palatine tonsils that can become infected, the lingual tonsil will occasionally become infected and have a very similar appearance. Once again, you can see that tiger stripe pattern, but now we're a little more inferior in the neck at the level of the lingual tonsil. Same basic idea though, this is a lingual tonsillitis much less common than infection of the palatine tonsils. Here's an example of someone who has marked enlargement of all of Waldeyer's ring. The example we're showing here is the adenoids. The adenoids here are completely filling the nasopharynx, way too large for an adult. This happens to be a, an adult with HIV, and this is an example of how HIV enlarges all of the, the tissue within Waldeyer's ring. We can see such enlargement on lateral plane films. Normally, we should be able to see an epiglottis sti sticking up here, but the vollecula that normally uh, sits uh, above the epiglottis and uh, allows us to see it by contrasting with the air-filled vollecula instead has been filled with soft tissue. This is the lingual tonsil enlarged, completely filling the vollecula. Similarly, we can see the nasopharynx being filled with enlarged tissue from the adenoids. Here again is an example of diffuse enlargement of Waldeyer's ring. The adenoidal tissue completely fills the nasopharynx. The palatine tonsils are enlarged. The lingual tonsil is enlarged. When we see this, there are a few diagnoses that we should consider. By far and away, the most common cause of enlargement of Waldeyer's ring is an upper respiratory infection, whether it's mononucleosis with Epstein-Barr virus or whether it is another upper respiratory infection. This is the most common cause for this radiologic appearance. Unfortunately, there are other diseases that can do exactly the same thing, notably lymphoma and HIV infection. So in this situation, I think we are... Uh, we are mandated to say something to that effect, although it hardly puts the patient at ease to hear that lymphoma and HIV are on the differential when they may just have an upper respiratory infection. It is useful to ensure that the clinician and the patient do appropriate follow-up and ensure, at least clinically, that the, this enlargement has resolved when the upper respiratory infection is gone. This is the size of a normal lingual tonsil, just for comparison. It should be just a small amount of soft tissue sitting along the base of tongue. Here's an example of a solid enhancing mass arising in a palatine tonsil. This one happens to be squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, you might think that because of the solid enhancement, it would be more likely to be lymphoma, but squamous cell carcinoma is sometimes solidly enhancing. Here's another example of a malignancy arising within the palatine tonsil. This one's heterogeneous, which might make you think that it's more likely to be squamous cell carcinoma, but this one happens to be lymphoma. So it's very confusing. Squamous cell carcinoma far more common and so should probably be at the top of the differential, but don't forget tonsillar lymphoma.